Okay. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> I know our last meetup was just like a couple of weeks back. But so as mentioned in the meetup, uh, it's a very short notice. So I really thank you all so much for coming by at such a very, very short notice. I think it was just like six days ago when I sent out the um, announcement. Yeah. So thanks so much. Um, okay. So another big thanks is actually to Collision Aid because um, Brian managed to link us up and uh, Singy just kind of, okay, sure, let's do it. <laughs> so, so the venue sponsorship was uh, very fast and uh, I really thank them for like, providing us this very awesome venue that you're in here with a very nice uh, alien ship <laughs> view, right? Yeah. Um, for those who are here, who, who is the first time here? Quite a bit. Okay. Here in the venue, as well as here in the meetup. <laughs> um, as you may already know, this is a no presentation kind of meetup, right? Because it's a, it's a talk show kind of format. So if you are here to look, want to look at some slides, I'm sorry, there isn't any slides for you. Okay, um, but last, last month there was a comment, right, that um, perhaps the questions or the meetup could be more team, team to a certain topic, right? So today I think you guys should know what's the team, right? It's actually more skewed towards startups and UX, um, Google, right? Oh, okay. And emotions in design. Okay, so I'm going to give you some hints on what kind of questions you can, of course, ask. Um, so today we're going to have someone very special. He flew in all the way from Israel. And uh, let's give a big hand to Dr. Jacob. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's uh, get on the hot seat, shall oh, we? I can yeah. see it, right. Hi. So first of all, I want to thank you very much, Kiat and Gidon and Hilit, for helping me arrange this. Um, in such a short notice. Um, <coughs> my name is Jacob, Jacob Greenspan. I live in Israel. As always, I'm the oldest guy in the room. Let me scan it for one second. Yep, I'm the oldest guy in the room. That's life. And I've been practicing UX for the last, well, I can say it, 20 plus years. And um, I have a PhD in cognitive psychology. I'm actually sort kind of a psychologist. I deal with the way that the brain Processing inform in and you know process and use information and make decisions and so forth. And um, I've established the biggest company in Israel for UX design about 17 years ago. Probably part of this audience was in high school or even below that. And with a partner, I found myself running a company with 65 employees after 10 years, so I sold my half. I've established a little startup by myself. You can look it over the internet. It's called Intelligim. Um, we train human brains. If you want, I can elaborate on that later on down the road. And most important, recently, for the last four years, I've been helping Google to build the Launchpad program globally wise. And I'm kind of very active and very responsible for the UX chapter of this activity. Okay, thanks for the introduction. So, uh, I guess we always start off the kind of questions by trying to understand the context and the background. And you gave quite a huge chunk of, of that already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm gonna move on. Um, how, how is it like working with Google? Well, uh, Google is an amazing company, of course. Uh, uh, truly, it's really amazing company, it's open company. And it's fascinating because I got the honor to build the program or help with the program all around the globe. So actually it's all about Google, but it's all about the UX experts that I met globally wise. And I've been interviewed UX experts. It's go from right to left, I mean from east to west, and Indonesia, um, India, all around Europe, of course. Um, it would be Paris, Barcelona, London, Greece, Athens, I mean, and then Mexico City, Sao Paulo, and yes, all around there. So the experience of getting to know UX experts and talking to hundreds, literally hundreds of UX experts globally wise, it's really an amazing experience. 
And um, just just in case you all are thinking that I'll be hogging the whole <laughs> series of conversation, no, uh, so you all will be asking some questions later on. So um, I guess I wanted to, to learn more about, like, I mean, you have met a lot of startups, right, mm -hmm. throughout this journey. And what is the kind of like single most challenge when it comes to UX and startups? Yes, that's fascinating because um, when you look at startups, and I've been meeting, meeting in person tens of startups and been talking to my network of mentors globally wise uh, tens of times, and it turned out that the number one problem of, or challenge of startups is basically that they simply hardly meet any of their users. Neither before making the design, nor while doing the design, or after making the design. It's simply unbelievable. In some cases, they meet them once. In some cases, the people that they meet are basically friends and family, nothing more than this. So not really much of user research, not much of usability testing. And that's the first number one challenge of startups, to get out of the office, go out there, and meet the, start, uh, the users. This one, and B, get real feedback or real user research or, or real usability testing while using their apps in, with real users in real environments. And so when, when you meet a startup that uh, is in the Launchpad program, right? so what are the usual things that you will do with them? Okay, so let me, if it's okay, I'll just elaborate a little bit about the program because I think you might find it interesting. Um, the program was started in Tel Aviv, and basically it started as a lunch per week. So they take Google invite startups about 10 to 20, depending on the on the wave, and they get four days of training. One day is marketing, one day is product, one day is technology, and one day the most important profession on earth, which is UX, of course. And then there's an integration of that. And um, so it started by mentoring, and the format is basically the same all around the globe, which means a startup arrive, and then we interview them, of course, to get to know what is the current state, and then we start to give them some mentoring sessions. And mentoring is always one by one, and that's, that's the program by uh, the basic program. And typically, you will sit with a startup anytime between one hour, which in my humble opinion, it's too short, up to one day which is too f by far too hard for a startup, typically three to four, five hours with a startup, and you try to find out uh, their challenges. Now, um, as for the challenges, typically we start by a simple diagnostic. Every experienced mentor knows that. Um, simply the first question I in person ask is, um, tell me a little about your product, and then I ask the second question, how many users have you met recently? And they say a lot. And I ask what is a lot? And they say two. And I ask what is recently? And they say six months ago. So this is a typical answer. And, that's f and we take it from there. Just to understand the crowd, uh, who is from a startup environment, actually? Or like designers working in a startup? One, two? Two things. OK. The rest? Oh, three, OK. Designers in uh, enterprise or in uh, organization. Okay, quite a few. Agencies or s design studios. Quite some. What about the rest? You're all wearing the black label, right? That says, I'm <laughs> just curious. <laughs> okay, so, and, and how are startups like reacting to such a intervention from, from you? Yes, it's a, it's a great question. Um, Actually, it has much to do with the country, okay? Uh, keep in mind that um, there are multiple cultures out there. And for example, if you get to an Israeli, I'll start with the most challenging one, as Israeli, they know better than you are. And they are great UX experts. And they explain to you what to do today and tomorrow, and I mean, typically. Uh, so it's harder to convince them because it's a culture of, I mean, arguing all the time. Very peacefully, but you know, discussion, and ends up with some cultures, for example, in the East, when they keep on writing, I, I won't say the name of the country, but one of the countries from the East, from the East, they, I just in, 
talked to the, the startup and they hanged with their head, waved their heads and wrote and it was too quiet for me. So I asked them after 20 minutes or 10 minutes, do you agree with what I said? And they say, no. And I asked, so why didn't you tell me? So they told me it's impolite. So the reaction range range from this point to this place. And actually from this, <laughs> this is the other point. Uh, typically they listen because they know that you're an expert. And when I create a community around the globe, I make sure to, to select the best practitioners. So we have to make sure that they are know exactly what they are doing about, talking about. So typically the reactions are really great. Sometimes I've get an email saying, you totally changed what I thought and, and so forth. Right. And um, how is your experience with Singaporean startup then? Actually, I haven't met lots of Singaporean startup because I'm here for Southeast Asia, except for Singapore as for day. So you have to ask me a different question. <laughs> okay. Anyone has something to ask at this point? Yes. How do you get selected for the launch pad to go to Israel? Okay, how do you get selected? Yeah, how do you get selected to the program? Yeah. Um, first of all, I'm not from Google. By the way, I'm not a Googler. I'm a consultant like half of you, if I got it right. I'm just advising Google and helping Google. I'm part of... Um, so, basically, what happens is that we try to create communities. Because um, we found out that working as a team is 10 times better than a bunch of individuals. So, typically, when I get to a new country, uh, we, may, we start a process of interviews. And we start to learn the local market, who was the influencers, who was the most active, who had the most um, experienced. I can share with you my criteria for selecting great UX mentors, um, but these are my criteria. Some people might have different, different um, angle. First of all, they should be a very nice person. If you're not a nice person, think of that. It's a really stressful situation for a startup. You are the expert, they have a dream. Either they raised funds or before raising funds, pre-A, pre-seed, after seed, and all of a sudden you tell them, no, this is right and this is wrong and so forth. We can elaborate later on how does a mentoring session looks like, okay? So first of all, you have to reduce tension and you have to be a very nice person. That's the first thing on earth. And the second one is to be an expert. Now, in my opinion, an expert is someone who saw many, many, many examples. Why is that? Because if you want to help a startup, you have about two to three hours top to help the startup. And you can't waste one hour and a half in order to learn the situation. So you have to figure out kind of fast what's going on there. And having said that, you have to see lots and lots of examples. My third criteria typically is education, but it's not necessary. I've seen great, great educated, people with great education, which are the best mentors and see great mentors without any formal education. But typically it goes together. Not necessarily, but typically. Right. I guess your question was, how do your startup get into the launch pad? No, I mean, just any startup, but like, uh, is, oh. is, is, this, like, is this the incubator? Is that oh, sorry about that. I answered the wrong question. Well, that's for that. That's typically me. Yeah, uh, but that, that's for how do we as UX professionals get in? Right? Sorry, the other way around. <laughs> yes, um, I have no influence, uh, or the mentors have no influence about the selection. Typically, it's from an incubator or so. But it tends to do with the, st the stage of the program because there's a lunch pit week, which are activities in each and every country, and there's the boot camp in San Francisco, or, or, which is more of an accelerator, in which startups do submit their their um, resume or their details and selected. Is there, is there a launchpad we can do? Launchpad in Singapore I'm not aware of, but it doesn't mean that there isn't. I have to check it out for you as much as I know, not, not that I'm aware of, but I can check it for you easily and share it via you, yeah, of course. Okay, just before we move on, uh, Singy, is the aircon? Yeah, it's not on. It, it's not on? Oh, it's on. Oh, it's on. Okay. Oh. Okay. Yes. Okay, no worries. So, yeah, just to <laughs> empathize everyone that's sitting down there, you know, I'm also here. <laughs> it's very simple. Each person produces 70, 70 watt, like heating bulb. You can calculate 70? what is the size of the heater, yeah. <laughs> On average, yes. That, yes, the, it can be measured. 70 watt lamp, yes. 
<laughs> okay, anyone has any other questions? So, yes. uh, having met with several UX practitioners across the world, experts, uh, what is one area that you find particularly lacking in UX practitioners per se? Oh, that's a tough question. I repeat it so everyone can hear it. Okay. Um, I was talking about what is lacking, way, lacking with uh, UX, with the startups, now you say from the practitioner perspective. First of all, I don't have a representative sample. Why is that? Because when I try to help and create a community, say in Germany, in India, it doesn't matter where, I always address the top layer. So I am slightly blind for what happened in the lower level. I mean, or the less experience. By the way, when I say lower, I'm not saying stupid, not saying non, not talented. I'm just saying of experience, just the sake of the amount of experience. Um, but the thing that differentiates, in my opinion, the the professionals and those who are not, those who know a thing or two about user research. I found out that there are many, many big names in some countries who still don't understand that they have to meet the users. Really, truly. Now, it might be twisted toward what I think. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I found. And when I address someone, typically it's high enough level there. Um, typically, my main problem is what is UI, what is UX, of course. What is UI and what is UX? Don't even start that. <laughs> OK. Actually, I've interviewed about 300, 400 UX experts around the globe. All of these countries I interviewed at least two times or three times the number of mentors I had to help Google to find. And the second or third question, out of curiosity, what is the difference between UI and UX? And since I interviewed 300, let's say, around, I got about 500 answers because few of them were Israeli and were of two opinions about any subject. <laughs> so that's us. Um, so in some countries, UX is the visual design and UI is the workflow and the logical design. In some places, UI is the user research and the UX is the pragmatic design. Oh, not pragmatic, sorry, the detailed design. In some countries, it's country, by the way, all the, all the answers I get from a certain country are typically the same. Okay, no difference between, just within countries. In some countries, UI is all about the um, higher level conceptual and UX is about the detail design. So you can see this, this basic patterns. I don't know where Singapore is, by the way. What is UI and what is UX? <laughs> Anyone want to Anyone want to? give okay. it a try? Later on, you can address me. <laughs> Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's supposed to be conversational, right? So it doesn't help that if we are keep talking and the crowd is quiet. Marketing buzzwords. Marketing buzzwords. Okay, oh. fair enough. Yes, I, I totally agree with you. It's in many cases, it's marketing buzzwords, but in many cases, it's used to recruitment. Keep that in mind, that in, in, in different countries, when you make you know, jobs, you have to write something. So the right UI, the right UX, so... By the way, in, other, in some countries, UX is a person that can even code some light coding and make some visual design using Photoshop. So it has to do with the country. Yeah. Perhaps, uh, I, I think uh, there's a recent trend in uh, startups, especially going towards AI, that area, right? Perhaps, can you share with us whether have you consulted or helped any of those startups in Google Launchpad? And if there is, right, what are some of the UX concerns that, uh, that you throw up there? Or your expression you post to them. You're talking about specifically uh, AI companies or in general? In AI, uh, okay. Say. okay so I think this is the new thing, right? So we're lo yes. not looking at UI, UI per se, but more on the yes. conversational I part. Yes. Yeah. Well, first of all, this AI thing is new as well. It's an old, right? So, for example, bots, right? Everybody talks about robots and so forth. Do you know when, when was the first co computerized bot? What was the first one? It's, I will make a deep look into it. It was it named Elsa. You can find it in the internet. Many replication. It was done by a psychiatrist, American psych psychiatrist. And it simply asks you a few questions. For example, if you wrote down, I'm feeling sad. So it looked at the word sad and find if there's the word sad, happy, angry, it say, so it asks you, why do you feel sad? And, and if you said, if you say, for example, you answered, 
my 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 father just so what was your relationship with his father very stupid questions and people used hours and hours of interaction with such bot so it was back to the 80s by the way and actually there was a big debate just as a preference as a side there was a big debate if it's going to finish psychiatry profession because bots will be our next generation psychiatrist they aren't by the way if you haven't noticed that yes my psychiatrist always say i'm just kidding okay so that's one so it's an old as well as it's a new or, or back in the 80s when there are you know there are airplanes got more and more computerization computers inside there were tons of questions where is the responsibility of the computer and where is the human being but as for startups i simply don't think we i I don't feel that I have enough um, knowledge as for now. I didn't gain enough uh, enough uh, samples to say something intelligent about that. I only know that uh, typically they no not typically uh, not enough information, but they are struggling with the basic questions of how um, how independent should the the AI be? Where should I put the user in the loop and so forth and so forth? Nothing new that all of you are not familiar with. From previous history, but ask me this question in a year from now. Okay. So um, you, know you mentioned. Oh. Sorry, maybe we'll see if there's anyone else. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just so we moderate the session and. Yes, yeah. Behind us. Yes, Terry. Yeah. Uh, sorry, can I just check what is your design process and your thoughts on jobs to be done versus persona? Okay, job to design and bad persona. Uh, my opinion is not important because I'm, my opinion is as good as yours, but I can tell you about what I see in the program and in general about personas, okay? So, um, what I see, which is very, very common in startups all around the world, is that they assume a certain persona which is based on no zero user research, as I said before. And then they fall in love with their persona I'm not kidding. And then they get more and more convinced that this persona is the right persona because they're getting more and more familiar. It's like going in the wrong direction, right? You're trying to look for a place. It doesn't happen nowadays with Google Maps and so forth. But remember the time that we had to travel and navigate by ourselves? And then we saw a building and we passed it. And the next time we pass it, it looks familiar. And you say, okay, I'm nearby. It's really familiar for me. Same happens to personas. And in many cases, the first thing that I ask a startup to do is to write down the persona. I just simply, in Hebrew we say, we go along with them. So they write the persona and ask them to take a pen and delete any part of information from this persona, which they don't know by asking someone or reading decent research about. And typically I get a completely black just the name remains. <laughs> That's a typical... No, no, it's funny, but it's really, really sad because I've seen so many systems which are designed for completely non-existing users because that's what their personas. So in this sense, in my humble opinion, um, I, in per as for myself, I never use personas because I know, I'm aware, fully aware that I can be biased dramatically by that. But that's me and startups for sure. They completely get biased by their own personas. So I guess the next question will be then, what do you use? What? What, what do you use, if not persona? <sighs> Simply, I make user research. I try to understand who the users are. Um, it can be many techniques. It can be ethnographics. It, it can be tons of other ways of doing this. I live in person in Israel, and in Israel, I think that you got it by now. Everybody is the best expert to know everything about everything. So. <laughs> I try to listen to my customers, but yes. Um, yeah, I try to meet the users, try to interview them. There are tons of literature how to do it right. It can be ethnographic. But I, I, frankly, I must tell you something. The, the minute you get out and meet your users and start to interview them, or to see better, to see how they react in the normal environments, that's the point that you're reducing your chances to be mistaken already. If I make a persona, it's just for the sake of communication with the customer, because customers love persona, right? It's something very concrete, they can touch it, it's tangible. So I use persona only for communication with customers, if so. Okay, and our customers can fall in love with. <laughs> yes. Okay, hey, now, uh, from personas, uh, there could be different users for a particular app. So it could be millennials who have a certain requirement, 
for Gen Z who would have a totally different department. There could be women uh, 45 to 55 who are different departments. So how do you satisfy the various needs by a single app? So how to go about doing it? Uh, how to address the needs of various sections of the users? Yes, uh, let me repeat the question. It's okay because typically the people at the back don't hear it. Um, if I have multiple types of users and personas, what do I do in this case? And again, I'd love to answer it in the startup perspective, but it's true for, I think, and in other directions. Um, some techniques I can use here. First of all, I try to address the marketing person, try to find out which market segments are of interest marketing-wise. And then, in many cases, I can narrow the number of, okay? Because if, for example, the minute the startup answers to my very simple questions, who are your users? And the minute they say, everyone, I know they are wrong, right? You know this answer, right? Everyone will use this. Of course, even the 80 years old men who can't see use my app for yo or whatever, I don't, doesn't matter what it is, yeah? So, um, uh, so this is the one thing that I do. And yes, no other choices. You have to go and visit your segment and segmentation and see what's going on there. It's, it's the hard way, but otherwise you typically, I speak for myself, it's always a failure. And we know whenever I fail, it's because I didn't know my market or my users good enough. By the way, many, in many cases, neither the startups nor companies differentiate between users and customers. That's another discrimination that many startups don't make. The decision maker about the purchase is not necessarily the user of the application. It happens all the time and they don't discriminate. So, sorry for giving you a bad answer, which means we have to work harder, especially if you're a startup. Or simply focus on a segment. That's it. You can always focus on one segment and then elaborate. Okay, yes. Um, typically, how large should the sample size be for a for user research uh, study for them to know for a startup particularly? Yes. Uh, because they don't have the means or the resources always to do a proper user research. Um. Okay. So I'll repeat the question and how big should be the sample for user research? Now, let's dis does it differentiate between user research and usability testing, okay? So if you're talking about usability testing, that you go out there, present the application, ask them to use it and make it the right way, there's the magical number of five, right? We all know it, five, eighty percent of the it comes back to the days of Nielsen, I think. But these are five experts, not five typical users. So it has to do with the complexity of the application. But if you're talking about user research, that is trying to get to know your market, there's no magical number. Um, because in some cases, there might be only a few that you start hearing the, uh, or see the same observations again and again. In some cases, you need 20. But I want to address a very important point that you pointed out, especially a startup who, don't, who doesn't have much research. A uh, resource, oh, sorry. So what we have actually done in Tel Aviv, and I'd love to share it with you because it's completely open, we made the do-it-yourself user research for startups. And I'd love to share it with you, with you. Feel free to use it. So you simply can um, um, teach the startup how to do, do it by themselves. And don't need even our document. Because any user research is 10 times better than nothing, right? So you simply teach them a little bit how to sample the users and teach them how to make the right. And you teach them not to say, I'm from company X, which makes the best solution for and so forth and glorifying the sales so forth. And it typically works very well. So you can teach the startup to do it by themselves. And there are tons of books, by the way. Tons of books you can ask them to buy and read. Right, that gentleman there. When you're talking about meeting your users, uh, seeing them in their environment, what methods do you use to really get to the truth? Because what I find is there's a really big difference between what people say or tell you or even show you to what they really normally do in their everyday life when you're not there. Of course. Yes, so how can I avoid lying, which is... A, lying. It's not a deliberate lie, yes, that's what I want to say. They don't they lie to themselves, the users truly believe that they behave in a certain way and when they describe it. So if you have enough time and resource, simply observe them, okay? If you don't have, try to observe them using systems which are similar to the one that you want to create. And in addition, you can interview them and typically, you know, a good inter interview doesn't 
deal with what you think, but with what you say that you are doing. And yes, there are tons of biases, of course. The minute you, we all know this uh, Sony example, you know, familiar this Sony example with the Walkman. Um, Sony, it's, it's a great story, by the way, uh, probably a legend, but it's still a good story. Sony first created the first Walkman and uh, it was something really revolutionary that days. You walk on the street and listen for music, you do it by using a cassette. Do you know what a cassette is? You're, some of you are really young. It's a tape. <laughs> it's used to roll. Okay, never mind. I know that. Yes, I know you, that. You know that? Of course I know that. Okay. <laughs> Um, and they even invented these really, really thin um, uh, headphones, okay? And they made a focus group, that's, the, that's the, the legend, of course, I don't know if it's true or not. And then they ask the users, which color do you like? And they say red and blue and yellow. None of the participants in the focus group said black. Who wants a black Walkman? And when they stepped out of the room, they gave them a present, which was a Walkman. And they could select any physical, real. Walkman that they, and which pile disappeared? The black, of course. Now that's the legendary, I'm not, I'm not sure if it was, it's correct or not, but you're completely right. Asking users about what they want to behave and how do they believe they are going to behave as not typically as nothing to do with reality. So observing them and asking them, what have you done and so forth, it's better. Always be honest with them, always be, I mean, it's, you should be always honest and legal and so forth, but it's completely doable. Right. Could it? Yeah. I'm just curious about uh, Google's uh, venture into this UX thing. Because if, it's, if I see uh, most of the products from Google in the past start creating UX. So, <laughs> yeah, I can see the, yeah. the Google Glass and so on. So, so what do you, how do you see the, the interest in Google? And what, what, why do you think they struggle so much with uh, the UX? Um, mm. Let me repeat the question. You asked me, you yeah. said that. Um, most of what what you said, uh, Google. Hi, um, he said that <laughs> some of uh, pro Google products are not the best UX wise. Okay. Uh, well, since I don't design, haven't designed any product for Google, I simply can't tell you because I simply don't know. But what I do know is that Launchpad program does invest a lot in making startups excel excel in in UX. So I really don't know what is the reason for that or how true it is. Um, but um, as much concerned to the program that I'm involved with, with Google, I know that they really, really, there's huge amount of UX mentors and there's really, really trying to make, help the startups mentor uh, UX wise. As for the quality of Google products, I simply, I'm as good as you are, yes. Okay, so I wanted to bring the conversation back a little to um, professional development, right? So we have, of course, the new, uh, there are many new designers entering into the market, um, graduate from general assembly, zero to three years. Uh, and we have a small pool of those who are experienced and so on. So what would be your advice for like the new entrants and also the you know, uh, professionals that are already experience. Great. And again, I will use my perspective, what I saw around the globe and not necessarily in Israel. Um, first of all, this situation of many new newcomers to the market of UX with few experts is not unique to Singapore. Okay. First of all, keep that in mind. It's the same, I think, in Israel for a very great extent. There are some countries that you don't see it at all. There are some countries which you see it a lot. So it's not unique to Singapore. I assume, it's just an assumption of course, I do assume that it's because the startup communities and the awareness for the importance of UX read so dramatically, so there's such a huge need, so the, you know, in many countries, the education system simply is not fast enough to, to I mean, to keep the, the pace, right? I do assume that's an assumption. I can share with you what we do in Israel. In Israel, let's put it a different way. Um, Many people consult me in Israel and other places what to do if I'm new in the market. And my r rule of thumb number one is never ever walk by yourself. Because if you walk by yourself, you'll keep on making mistakes. And if you keep on making mistakes, it's perfectly okay. I make mistakes, everyone makes mistakes, but there's no one to correct me. Actually, I want to share a secret with you. I'm really experienced designers, like many are in the audience as well. And I hardly make any project by myself. 
And if I have a project to do by myself, I find myself a partner, in which at least few hours I'm consulting with my core UX designer about what I'm doing. Because it's so, in my opinion, it's so easy to go wrong when you make UX design that I'm sure that I'm going wrong from time to time, like anybody else, okay? So if you're a newcomer, and many people, I, many times, sorry, I hear the question, I have two job offers. One, to be the UX in a company, in a startup, by myself, or to be part of UX team in a bigger company. So my answer is very easy, very strict. Go to the second option, always. Why is that? Because you'll get to learn from your, for other mistakes, someone to correct you. This is the first. And you have to work by yourself, try not to work by yourself. This is one. Second, um, yes, it takes time to get some practice, you know. It's learning and practice all the time. But, you know, you can't learn to swim by looking at YouTube videos. It will get you a better swim to a certain degree, but you probably won't be able to keep on swimming if you want practice. So practice, 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 which means that you have to find your customers or work in a better, a bigger organizations. And I truly believe that you, if you are in newcomer to, uh, to this industry, by the way, anyone, any industry, uh, the best thing would be to try to find yourself a team to work within a team. Typically, there's a huge dramatic change within a year or two compared to those who work by themselves. And how about for those like me? No. You are perfect. What? <laughs> I'm not. What's the question? <laughs> no, like for um, experience, you know, like probably we are like five, eight years or we've been mm. a designer for some time. Okay. Yeah. What I was doing in Israel and I strongly suggest you to adapt this, uh, I mean, I can't suggest you anything, but it worked for me. As part of Google activity, I've created a local community. And this local community is now about 25 really, really great experts. And we are meeting once a month to discuss questions among ourselves. And in many cases, one person presents something and all the rest discuss it. In some, play, some cases, there's an open discussion. And we found out that these mutual circles work great for us. Works great for us, sorry, it's been a long day. And it really works great for us. One thing that we try to do in Israel, and I think it worked, I'm not sure about that, is we take all of our UX mentors, so, and we made a conference, one for the startup, one for the, for, for the UX community, and we try to share in very short talks what we learned. So we try to share knowledge. Because, you know, the, the best the industry will rise the best would be for everyone, you know that. It's, that's my experience in Israel. If it fits you, I really don't know, but that's my experience. All right, Priscilla? Does your psychology background help in your UX design? And if so, how? Oh, does my background in psychology? Well, I'm first of all my cognitive psychology. I know nothing about what any person felt about his mother and father by just three. No more than you do, of course. Um, Oh, mommy. No, never mind. Okay. Um, that's, that's first. Um, so I deal with the way that the brain thinks and operates. Um, once upon a time, when I was young, trust me, it was very, very long time ago, there was two ways to get into this industry of UI. UX was only in Donald Norman book, by the way. <laughs> it wasn't exist out of Donald Norman book. I think Donald Norman, right? Yes. It started there. Maybe I'm wrong. Helit, you can correct me. Um, but as much as I recall, and it was UI, user interface. Right? It was interaction, depending on the age of your age. And back in the days, there were two ways to get from what I know. One is both through a computer science programmers who fell in love with the interaction and got in there, or cognitive psychologists like I am who got into more into computers. I think that today we see all around the globe a much more variety, and I think it's great. You can see people coming from, you know, visual design, computer science, ethnographics, lots and lots and, uh, of, but I think it influenced dramatically what you are doing later on down the road, okay? Since I'm a cognitive psychologist, I always try to find the gaps between what I design and the system that I create and what human beings can 
are able to be used or invest in the application, okay? So I'm always about the differentiation between what it requires me to do and how can I operate with the system. Therefore, training is really important to me and so forth. Um, that's for me. People, other mentors or other experts which come from visual design tend to look at it from a completely different angle, which, I mean, there's a multiple way of looking at uh, of the thing, it's, which is really great. But for me, as a cognitive psychologist, I tend to look about the ability of the users to handle with this thing that I'm designing right now. So, I, I think there's a growing trend as well that um, user research, you know, someone that's doing user research actually has a psychology background. Do you think that helps? Well, uh, yes and no. Yeah, I think it does because it use, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with academic research. Okay, I'm not if how many of you. Some of here probably more, some less. But there's simply no difference between any user research to any academic research. Sorry to say that. Sorry to say that out loud. But what is an academic research is making your research in order to find something about human behavior the best way you can with limited li minimum amount of biases, as you said before, sir. So this is basically what we are doing in user research. It's the same techniques, the same thing. Actually, I was honored to to really to run the biggest company in Israel for UX design, and I accepted many people from many disciplines. And the easier for me about user research was those who learned psychology specific course about user research methods. Immediately understand what is, how do you measure, what is the biases, how to make it right, what is the difference between six to seven items questionnaire, and so forth and so forth, what are lie detectors, detectors and so forth. Uh, but I'm not saying, actually I'm saying the opposite, there's no problem for anyone who's not psychologist to make great user research. Right. So I guess yeah. what's more important is the technique in research on conducting research or yes. rather than having, I mean, having a background or not doesn't necessarily. Yes, having a background always helps and making the right techniques is even even better. Yeah, right. but I mean, but you're right, yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. uh, I just want to bring back to the question of the customer versus the user. So if the customers are the ones assessing the products, then how do we reach out to the users so that they want our product? Yes. It's a great question. So how can you reach to the customers versus the users and so forth? Now, it has much to do with the format, I think. It has much to do with the, with the organization you're dealing with, okay? Let's take, for example, this early stage startup, which makes, say, the next Airbnb. I don't know if any of them, that's like something hypothetical. So the customer and the user are typically the same, right? And if you're talking about an IT department in a big corporate, then the customer, who is the probably the IT manager, um, is the one to make the decision, in my opinion, is the customer, who is the one to make the decision, is not the user, which will be someone in the organization who is the application. So it depends on the situation. If you're talking about big organizations, and according to the pool that you just uh, ran, Kiat, the only option that you give didn't cover who works for a big company, so that's the only question you didn't ask, so I guess it's the rest. Um, I guess that it's about uh, finding the right real users because typically the customers say, let me represent the users. I don't know if it happens in Singapore, it happens anywhere always. else, always. <laughs> and hey man, if you were the typical user, you won't be a customer, right? So we have to deep dive. And then comes the very, very well-known bias of Okay, I'll give you the best user inside an organization, and typically they give you the lousiest one because that's the one that they don't mind wasting their times. And so, to make sure that you are scanning the right one, and in startups it's ten times easier because typically in startups the distance between customers and users it's much easier. Yeah. Well, sir, <coughs> corresponding with this question, so how do you do? strategy in terms of differentiation between customer and client. Because you know customer is normally one visitation or often, but with a client you have a concentration and a continuity. So how do you devise your own strategy in terms of different differentiation? Yes, it's a tough question with customer and client, not customer and user, right? Customer and client. I 
I can hardly answer you that question because um, I can only sample it from Israel. And in Israel, typically the customer thing and the client are basically the same. So it's hard for me to answer you this question. I'm not, I'm, I'm not claiming to know everything. So um, I don't know here in Singapore if there's such differentiation. From the startup, startup environment, which are highly involved in the passing four years, this question doesn't barely exist because customer, users and clients are basically the same. But from the clients, if you, unless you mean clients, but the end clients of the organization, that's what you meant. Oh, sorry, buddy. Sorry, sir, I didn't understand it. Cost, clients are users from my perspective. Typically, I make systems for them and they are the users. Sorry, I thought that you were talking about customer and clients within the organization. No, okay, so. Yep. yep. Sorry, someone there first. When I hear about UX, we, it seems like we talk mostly about B2C and consumer market. Um, I wanted to ask you, with the startup you work with, how many of them are building products for the enterprise actually? Okay. And we could solve also the problem we have with uh, segmentation and we in shooting too, too broad to a too large audience. Okay, That's, these are actually two questions. The first question is, how, what is the proportion of B2B startups in the Lunchpad program? Um, which I cannot tell you because that's something which internally for Google, uh, I mean, two reasons. A, it's internal, B, I simply don't know, by the way. From the people you met? From the people I met, there are B2B customers, of course there are. So talking about B2B, yes, B2B, has different challenges because the sales cycle typically in B2B is longer. And the one that you have to convince to use your products are different from B2C. Um, it all sums up to the same quota of problems, but the problems or the challenges are lot slightly dramatically different, okay? Because in B2C, typically the, the main difference that you see with startups um, is that the B2C they typically do understand that they have 10 seconds of grace after downloading the app or 20 seconds of grace of two minutes, nothing more than this, you know, and simply they will uninstall it. And B2B startups tend to be much more focused on the functionality and less about the appealing. And you have to explain to them that if you're making an application for internal usage of you keep on selling all the time. Yeah, because nobody uses application that they doesn't, the people don't want. Can we say we are less focused on the UI for the enterprise, but more on the UX, how you integrate with the, the ecosystem kind of things, more on how it feels, how it connects? Yes, it depends on how you define UI and UX, back to question number one, because it's different, than, but according to what you ask, yes, completely right. I think if I understood what you mean by UI and UX, I mean, any answer is great, it's just, change various according around the, co the countries. Yes, you have to, in B2B, uh, you have to be much more focused on the, on the processes and make sure that it will be highly efficient. In B2C, the appealing should be 10 times more. And needless to say, in both cases, you have to be good in both aspects. But the, the, you can afford yourself slightly more in B2B. By the way, keep in mind that many uh, startups or many companies that make B2B are actually making B2B2C. Don't forget that. So it's the customer again by the end of the road. So we should be mind that as well. Okay. Uh, sorry, just everyone is still feeling warm, right? <laughs> yes, I'm. This is the best. This is the best. <laughs> okay. All right. So I guess you have to bear with it for a while. Uh, okay, so I think you had a question, right? Yeah, so on, Before the, we on the B2C side, right? It's just, so just to make sure the customer is the person that buys the product first and the user is the, the actual person using the product, right? That's yes, right. correct, yes. Okay. Want to make sure. Yes, in many cases the customer and the user are the same yeah. and in some cases they are completely not the same. It happened in B2C as well, by the way. For example, I decide to buy something and for my family and within my family, my wife decides to buy it and I'm using it, or vice versa. Or my kid uses it. Or in kids, it's always, my startup is all about the brain training, okay? I train 
athletes in brain, I mean, they play computer game and then they play ice hockey or basketball, depending on the product, better. So the user is the kid and the customer is the father or the mother. So this is a great example of differentiation, yeah. Yes. So Sorry, yeah, right. before we jump, yes, that. In general, enterprise customers are more difficult to handle, you know that. So how would you conduct uh, user research for an enterprise customer? Yes, you said that enterprise customers are more hard to handle. Well, since in the, in, yeah, yeah. Um, then B two C, um, I can argue that. Uh, I mean, let's put it this way. In my humble opinion, it's all about different set of difficulties, but it's sum up to the same level of problem, because in B two C, it's ten times B two C ten times harder for you to sample the customers the right in many cases. And in B2B, it's easier for you to find the right users, right? But uh, there are other challenges there, for example, like political and so forth. You go, for example, you make an IT system, and the person who uses it doesn't want to be very, very cooperative because knowledge is power. Until this point, he or she kept the knowledge in an Excel only for him or herself, and now you ask to put it available. Yes. So I don't think it's easier or harder. I think just think that the set of challenges changes. That's my opinion, but I might be wrong, of course. Yes, uh, lady in yellow. Yeah, thank you. I was wondering if you can share a little more about in the long, uh, long platform, how many of the users are actually the founders Yes, it's a great question. You are just repeated for everyone in this section. Uh, what is the difference between a startup as much as I see that it comes from a design background? Or I will elaborate on marketing if I may. Or let's call it around the user, okay? background compared to those who come from more technology or other backgrounds? It's a great question and there's no clear answer for that. But in general, I don't know the proportion, how many are there, but um, I think that someone who came from, um, from the product or from the marketing or from the UX perspective, typically tend to be much more focused on the, on the users and are much more aware of the importance of getting in touch with the users, which is only natural. And I think that the end result of the product is typically slightly different. So typically when I start work with a startup that one of the main founders is a, um, a technology person, typically I see a very efficient, very fast, very nice application functionality wise but it's simply packed in a way that nobody can use it in many cases. And or organized in a logic which fits them and not other. I'm not laughing about that phenomenon, it's just a profession. No, UX is a, is a field of expertise. That's, that's true. And, and the starting point are definitely di different, okay, about because of the product and the end result uh, and, the, and the support of the natural workflows is typically different. However, there are tons of exceptions. There you see great application designs by developers, tons of great application, and you see some very great looking application designed by UX experts in a company, I mean in a startup, which functionality wise has 10 times more function than needed. Any mistake you can think about can be presented. All right. The lady in grey. Yeah. <laughs> that's a very good shift that's, of the conversation. How can I tell that, that? That's a tricky question. How can I tell a good UX designer? First of all, you can look around you. I'm sure that you are all great. <laughs> yeah, raise your hand if you are a good UX yes, designer. Okay. Um, but seriously, um, well, it's, you know, um, there's a good old saying in my profession that says that in UX that, or UI, even back to the days of HCI, human computer interaction, MMI, machine interaction, it goes back to the 40s or 50s. 
that there's no such thing as good or bad system, there's only system which fits or doesn't fit to the user. I think that for a very great extent it has to do with the designer. In some cases, you're an early stage startup, you don't have enough budget, you can't hire the big name, so you hire good enough, which is great for you, because it's a, a wise use of your data, of your money, sorry, it's great for you, okay? And in some cases, this is a high-tech corporate, big corporate with tons of, and they don't want to make a mistake, so the selection for one is not selection for the second. So I think this should, should first of all, if you want to select someone, uh, define to yourself what do you want to get out of this interaction with this designer. This is one. And second, you know, there are all levels. Um, I find it very hard to, I mean, that's my perspective on user interaction is that we may be as smart as we think, but we can hardly anticipate human behavior. So if within the methodology of this expert, there are interaction with users trying to see how to use your product and your designs and as a designer I'll keep on iterating, iterating with users and see what uh, the reaction to what I designed or for this design design, this is a very good sign for me. But it might be different for you, I don't know. So, so you're saying a designer um, that if she's looking for one who always have the user in mind in every step of the process? Yes, and go out there and see how the user actually behaves. Right. That's my opinion. That keep in mind there are companies in which the user research and the user design are different, are different persons. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. So um, my question is linked to four questions, but it's more from a UX designer's point of view. Mm -hmm. So right now, uh, most clients would want for money, right? I want someone who can code, I want someone who can do UX, I want someone who can do UI. And the same person. The same person. Yes. So as a as a new startup in, in UX, let's say, should we generalize first or should we specialize? Well, it's a one million dollar question because that, no, no, not kidding. It's one million dollar question because I, I repeat it. So, should the, I even if if I may just extend it a little bit, should the UX expert be able of Programming. Should the UX, be, uh, UX expert be able of drawing just wireframes or use Photoshop and make great visual designs or any other tool, of course? Would, should the UX designer or UI designer, depending on the way you def define it, be able to make user research and so forth and so forth and so forth? Uh, well, we argue about that all the time. We discuss it in Israel. There are opinions this way and that way, and I assume that if I make a poll here in this room, I will hear tons of answers. It has the, however, the way I, I'm a person who likes to think about criteria all the time. So from the flexibility of employment, probably if you know more, it will be easier for you. But from the being a pro, needless to say, there are no more Michelangelo, probably one in the audience, but two, maybe seven, but I'm not Michelangelo. I can't be a sculptor and I can't be a painter and can't be a scientist, I can't. So I have to focus. So my own perspective is to be focused, but it's easy to me to say because, because I don't have, I'm not studying this. So it's really, but I think it has to do with the market. I don't know the Singaporean market, if the Singaporean market do wants all, all jobs in one person. That's exactly what happens in Israel, by the way. You see lots and lots of, of uh, jobs needed. Someone who makes UI, UX, what should be your skills, Photoshop, um, CSS design, wireframes, and that's, we see it all the time. Is it good or bad? I'm the last one to judge. Is it uh, good for your career or not? It has to do with the market. Um, focus, in my opinion, is always the best, but that's me. But in, I mean, in following on that question, in Israel then, uh, what, are, what are the designers doing? Are they generalizing or are they focusing more? In Israel, user research is harder to do. In Israel, user research, am I right a little? I think that, I mean, depending on the, on the, on the, on the depending on the, on the company, but user research, um, there were times that I couldn't say user research because research is the academia and used to say user study or something like this. Study sounds better. What? 
reality check. Yes, each one developed its own terminology to avoid the word research because Richard and I'm a company, high tech company, I don't make research, right? Um, but that's back all days now changed. And in Israel, typically the same person does it all. Typically, but not the CSS and the graphics. Most cases you see graphic designers or visual designers compared to what we call UI, UX, typically. Again, terminology. Right, yes. Okay. Uh, as for the earlier gentleman, uh, it was being said that observation is better, as you're saying, compared to asking questions. Of course. Right. But <coughs> it's just at the starting point where you don't have an app ready and you want to build an app with great UI. Mm -hmm. How do you go about doing the research? Okay, let me repeat the question. Let's assume that you don't have an application, you want to make a research. Now it's, you know, it's the chicken and the egg. If you make an application which has some resemblance in the world and you can observe real you, people using it, fine. But if you can't, you don't have access, you don't have limitation, you don't have their consent. Legally you can't in some cases, depending on, on the situation, right? And what do you do? So there's a small blue book, I don't know if you're familiar with, it's called The Lean Startup. Um, strongly advise you to, I, I think it's, it's, it's an I And simply, I, what I do, and what I teach my startups to do, and they do it and it works for them, even in the lunch pad, I tell them, take, take a napkin, draw something from other your best assumptions, get out there, show this napkin, start working. In some cases, they draw few napkins. I mean, it shouldn't be napkins. You can use any application. <laughs> you can use the POP. There are tons of applications out there. You can use Envision. Uh, I'm not recommending anything. There are tons of them. So, and get out there and start to collect real feedback. You might throw your design completely. It's perfectly OK. But this is basically the lean circle, right? Learn, design, test, right? So, it's, so it doesn't matter where you start. And if you start by some assumptions, from my experience, nothing, there wasn't any catastrophe happening that, okay? You can start by assumptions if you're flexible enough to let yourself simply say, I was completely wrong. That's my f two cents and it does, it shouldn't take more than a few days to get ready, to get out there, show something. Okay. Yes, sir. I just want to go back to uh, the few statements that we talked about women company interaction. Uh, so now as we see there is a, a slow transition taking place from a graphical user interface to a you know, natural user interface. Uh, so what are the uh, methodologies or you know, any best practices uh, that are UX uh, you should keep in mind? In this transition, yes, I think it's a very interesting question. You're saying what changed in our world while moving from graphical user interface or something based visually to auditory and speech interface. Well, first of all, this transition is, as you said, is slow and taking lots and lots of time. In this case, uh, I refer to what you asked me before about my background, psychological. Um, you can look for probably it's out there in the internet, um, great, uh, a few more than, artic more than article by Chris Wickens about the, the way that the type of task interacts with the type of interaction. Because talk to an application and hear it talking to you back, it's not a new concept at all. It, it's at least 25, 30, 35 years at least active applications. And what he found, it's really fascinating, that if you're talking about a semantic uh, task, that is a task that you have to analyze the meaning, then the talk and listen interaction is great. But what Professor Wickens found, is a guy, really talented professor from, from the States, but what he found that if you're talking about spatial task, for example, navigation, it's very hard to do it by hear and talk. So it, first of all, if you ask me, I can't anticipate anything, but I do assume that the visual interaction will remain with us long, long time, not because it's efficient or non-efficient, just because it fits to a certain, certain types of tasks, okay? For example, if I want to, to direct you where to go, it's 10 times easier to show you a map 
than to say go, go three steps ahead, now go to the right, now count till seven, go to the left, right? It's really hard, that's semantic. And as for best practices, I'm not aware of any. I know, I tried hard, I developed my own, you should develop your own. As for now, it's too new actually to have any. Now, there are best practices much concerned to speech and listen. For example, what should be the frequencies used, what should be the, uh, how much decibel about the uh, ground uh, level and so forth. But this is data that is there for at least 35, 40 years in the mill spec, by the way. Nothing new under the sun there. Uh, something specific for bot interactions, something specific for the way that we interact with robots. I think that the best practices are building nowadays, and I'm not aware of any best cookbook for that. Maybe if somebody knows, share it with us, but I'm not aware of any. So I, I think I want to bring the conversation back to a little bit about yourself, right? So being in like 25 years or more in, in the industry, what is your biggest failure? Oh, what is the biggest failure? that I didn't learn programming and become a developer. <laughs> but you don't mean this, right? Okay, uh, what's my bigger failure? Oh, I have tons of, let me select one. Yes. Um, bigger failure. Um, I once created an application for insurance, okay, insurance company. It was many, many, many years ago, and I designed the question-answer interaction, okay? It was, by the way, it was about 19 years ago, 19 years ago, not 90, because <laughs> I'm not that old, bro, I look like. So it was 19 years ago, ago and it was a touch screen. I know that you won't believe it because you're too young for that, uh, not really, but you do know when was the first patent for touch screen submitted? 1974. 1974 was the big, the first patent for touch screens. So nothing 40 years ago, 45 years ago. Yeah. Oh, so um, it was a really nice question and answer, okay? And the system asked me a question, what is your name? And I typed my name and he asked me what is your last name and I typed my last name and which car do you want to, um, to insure? And I said, said Subaru, you don't have Subaru here. Um, you have? Okay, Toyota and <laughs> which is a kind of type of Subaru, I'm just kidding. And, and I was sure that I'm the genius person on earth because it was so easy. And I, I even made a usability test for it and all the parameters were great, nobody got stuck and everybody was very happy with that. And they even the perceived time was about three minutes and the actual time was five minutes. And you know, times fly when you have fun. I'm really, our internal clock is set according to the hour work clock, by the way. So our ten o'clock is a very, very important parameter in when you're talking about usability. And everything was okay. And I thought to myself, oh, I'm such a genius. And then I asked them the last question, really, before they go. I asked them, do you like to purchase a product here? And 80, I remember the number, 85, 87% told me, hell no, never, ever. And I said, what happened here? Complete failure, by the way, complete failure. And, <laughs> and they told me, I, I couldn't believe what they told me. They said, okay, will the next uh, customer get an empty clean screen? It was a kiosk, right? And I said, of course. And immediately I started thinking about privacy and identity theft and all of these things, right? And then they told me, so, I'm not insured, anything that I wrote disappears. That was their reaction. And I, then I learned the lesson that it was completely a question of mental model, by the way. They didn't have a mental model of what is this thing that they are interacting with. So they didn't understand, so they thought it's, and I told them, hey, but you're gonna get a reprint of, of the policy. And they said, yes, but it's as if I'm sitting in front of a insurance teller he or she writes everything and hand me the paper. I'm not insured. And then I learned a lesson. Actually, it was the lesson of my life about my assumptions compared to user assumptions, about what I perceive as a good, what, what is understandable to me and what understandable to users. But the way it was solved very easily. Solved, sorry. 
it took only two stop in the process and I said, wait a second, in Hebrew of course, let me transfer the information to the company, which wasn't a lie of course. And then there was a noise of a modem, and then, sorry, and then they said, okay, all data was recorded successfully in our computer, which is not a lie, I never lied to any user, really. It was really recorded there, it was really transmitted by the way, and then that was enough. Everybody wanted to use the application, and then I learned my lesson, but it was a complete failure. Yep. Was it a good answer? I think so. <laughs> what do you guys think? I can select five more if you want. Okay. Then how, how about then the opposite? What, what, is, what has been your greatest success in, in the years so far? Getting to a meetup in Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> um, my greatest success? Um, I really don't know. Um, actually, uh, no, I, I can't. I can't. It's telling something good about myself. Skip to the next question. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so uh, anyone has any last questions? Maybe that, that sir behind here. Yeah. Uh, when you're uh, uh, designing a landing page uh, you know, to customers and users, basically if you get different feedback uh, from, because every user is unique, uh, so how much of personalization uh, you should do? That case. Okay, I'll repeat the question for the, for the audience. Uh, if I make a design for you, Google customers and the landing page, how much differentiation are there between the customers and how do I handle this, if I got it right? So first of all, I'm not designing for Google customers, uh, just designing for customers and for Google uh, Launchpad startups, I help them. So first of all, do you want to read the bad news or the good news? The good news is that me and Brad picture 99.98% of our genes. The bad news is that he, look, he looks 10 times bit better than I do, right? So people, not seriously, people are basically not, we are more the same than difference. And when you're talking about mass market, especially if you're talking about B2C, there are typical behavior over there. This one. Now, you said about personalization. Now, um, I found it that many, that's my belief on personalization and customization, okay? So personalization, in my definition, everybody can have his or her own. Personalization, if I know who's standing in front of me and change the application accordingly. And customization, if I change it by myself as a user, okay? So customization typically is a very, very tricky thing to do. A, because it enables you not to design till the last detail because they say okay so the customer will decide and they never decide they stay with the default and b there's an old saying if you give them a rope long enough they will hang themselves it's an old design say but i didn't invent it it's really really dangerous and uh, um, personalization yes you can do it and i do assume that now with this big data it will get much and more deeper but as for now, again, user research, you see your, your type of users, you try to find what's in common for them and adjust the landing page according to them. That's what you do all the time. And there are tons of techniques over there. Okay, there's a lot, a lot of last questions. <laughs> uh, how, how it, I mean, we are at 8.30, 8.35, right? Just because of the icon and so on, just want to check with everyone. How, how do you all feel? Okay, for another two more questions. Sure. sure, okay. Yes. Actually, just on that last point about customizing landing pages or whatever it is, don't we already do that? Like with Facebook, you open it up, it's customized to you. So why couldn't you just do that with a landing page anyway? So yeah. you know the Google sign in, whatever they've done, and then you can just read in things. Yeah, it, but it's a big difference between doing customiza customizing or personalizing. It, I think it's different, it's slightly different. It's not a question of terminology. Customization is what I customize for myself as a customer. And if I'm getting into Facebook and Facebook decides that I'm old enough that I have some TIS installation and give me this, then I get this advertisement all the time. It's really insulting me, by the way. Um, it's personalization. It's thinking, assuming who's the persona out there. And yes, it's been done all the time, but in some cases it insult me. Uh, once upon the time, about two years ago, my credit card was stolen in the United States, which happens, somebody stole, the, stole it, okay? 
And I, when I got back home, I got a phone call from the, for the in credit card company, say, we do assume, it was in Hebrew of course, we do assume that you are not buying six pack beer right now in Minneapolis. And I was all asleep, jet lagged back in Israel. And I say, no. And they told me, this, I will never forget this uh, sentence. We thought so, it doesn't match your agent profile. <laughs> Now, what have I felt? It was a completely personalization. Doesn't matter if it was over the phone, right? Was it a good personalization or bad? Well, they took care of my safety, right? Or my personal. Was I insulted on a scale of one to 10? Four. <laughs> yes, something like this, yes. Yeah, but, uh, but yes, you are completely right. We do it all the time. Today, mainly, I think it's done by simply by commercial, but tip, as much as I know, not many companies change completely or slightly the user interface itself when I'm getting the landing page if I'm young or old, for example. Which should be done, for example, but typically it's... Maybe now with the big data times it will happen more. Okay, last question. Sir. Okay, so we have been discussing user experience for mobile phones or desktop, for example. How is it evolving in terms of variables? For example, Google Glass, it was a big issue in terms of the user experience, the Google Glass. Yes. So how is it uh, evolving on variables like watches, the Apple Watch, and the other variables? So that's the future, and how is UX evolving over there? Yes, you're asking about the wearable devices such as shirts, uh, fabrics. Uh, well, I, I must frankly say that my answer will be as good as anyone in this room because I haven't met lots of startups dealing with wearable. So my sample set is too low. I always try to base what I say on something that I know or learn. So as for now, um, I really don't know. I read the statistics like you do about Apple Watches and so forth. And um, I'm not sure if this is such a huge trend. I'm the last one to tell. But um, as now you can see that there are not huge demand for wearable device UX developers. That's what I see the same way that you see. I have no inside information or not big enough sample to tell you something intelligent about it. Sorry. I wish I could, but um, oh, yeah. he's a failure, see? <laughs> that's a failure. Nice. Okay, so that's it for tonight. Let's give a round of applause to... Thank, Thank, you, you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We appreciate you coming here. <laughs>